Thank you so much, Deacon Sinching, for leading us in our time together. We welcome everyone as we gather to hear God's word. Were you uplifted by that singing, led by Jesse and the team? Okay. <laughs> Some people. <laughs> but it's so important as we gather that we take nothing for granted. With the freedom to not so much practice a religion, freedom to believe in God, freedom to believe the true and living God. And so may we not count it as a, as a, a right that we take for granted, but truly an honour and a privilege we gather to encourage each other. Let's begin by asking two questions. How are you? You want to turn to people around you and say, ask them, how are you? How are you? Then ask slightly more dangerous question, right? How are you is pretty generic, get slightly more specific. How are you feeling? You want to try that? How are you feeling? Okay. And there could be just um, a range of feelings, but I'll make it easy for us. You are either on the pathway of love or the pathway of hate. So it's a spectrum. How are you feeling? And so how far will you go with love? How far will you go to love? Is the question we want to address. And the flip side of it, later. So have you heard of Mike Fremont? His wife of 29 years old passed away suddenly from an aneurysm, which means a burst blood vessel in the brain. One of our staff passed away from that about 20 years ago. It's a shock to the whole, to the whole church. Eileen was her name. And so his wife passed away when she was 29. She just gave birth to her daughter who was two months old. Mike Freeman was left with three kids to look after. And he was, what word would you use to describe his life at that moment? Overwhelmed, overwhelmed. Having to hold down the job and having to look after three children, one of whom was two weeks old. And then he found something that would help him de-stress. He took up running, he took up running. And as he ran, he felt that he was capable of doing so and it's now 60 years later, he's now 101 years old. He's run marathons for 60 years. He's raised his children. He's well known around the world. Go, go Google him, not now, huh? not now, after the sermon, okay? I don't want to see you looking at your phones unless you're taking notes, right? And so how far will he go? He'll go? Was that just good for him? If he didn't learn something, do something in his life, to learn how to cope from being overwhelmed by the loss of life, but the stress of life in raising children, he would have lost it. And so how far will you go? Say, my goodness, a marathon? I can't even, I don't know, how far can you walk? Can you walk? He said, I can. How far? To the fridge. Back and forth. That's my daily exercise. And it's rigorous because I go so many times. <laughs> how far will you go to hate? So this passage is about hate. And the whole world has heard about Abby Choi. How much wrong did she do that the husband's family would conspire and premeditate to murder her? And not just murder her, but behead her and dismember her. We had something like this called the Curry Murders. And I remember it well because I just joined the Straits Times at that time. And my goodness, the news that was coming out of this Curry murders, right? It happened in a church called Orchard Road Presbyterian Church. And every day we waited for the journalists who covered that story to come back from court and say, what other details have you found? What details are there? It's all about hatred. And so if you read this passage of John 7, and you do not know it's about hatred, but it's hatred on a mega scale, is hatred on steroids, is hatred incomparable. You know why? Because it's one thing to hate each other humanly, horizontally. It's another thing to hate God. It's a totally different game when you hate God and hate His Son, whom He sends for you. And that's a strong word in John 7. And so we begin to understand this. I was going to say we begin to understand this story. And when you hear this as Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, then back to Gen A again, please do not think that when you hear the Bible, it's a made-up fairy tale, 
I could have used story, I could use a stronger word, narrative, I could use a more technical word, the text. When you read this pericope, can you spell that? This is not a story. This is the history of God in love with us and how we repaid God with hatred. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking the note he struck to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Jesus' brothers, leave here and go to where? Go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believe in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. So a few things to understand is, is vitally important. And what's vitally important? We need to, there are only three principles to buying property, right? Location, 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 right? And the new location is Tengah. Sorry, I just thought I'll throw that in. Uh, there are only three principles to understand God's word. Context, context, context. It's just, you've got to get back to the original context, then move to the overall context of what does this mean in the light of Jesus coming to the world before we plunge into our context. We write it in our discipleship group handbooks. Don't forget that. It's all about context. So what do you know about the Feast of Tabernacles? Here called the Feast of Booths. It's like that. It's celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month of the Jewish fest or calendar. The seventh month is called the Tishri. And it's to recall a most important thing. I want to ask you, right? What is it you recall? What rituals do you celebrate in a year? Birthdays, anniversaries, yes. Then Christmases and Good Fridays, and that's coming up. And yeah, what rituals? For them, they recall their wilderness years as they journeyed, journeyed to the promised land. But along the way, they muttered. Along the way, they grumbled. And so their history is full of disobeying of God. But God never did a U-turn on His covenant love. So as they tented, right, God was with them. To remember his steadfast promise, his steadfast love, fulfilling his steadfast promise and, and outworking of his purposes. And so I do not know, as I mentioned, tents, right? Have you ever pitched a tent? Live by tenting. So holidays have begun, and I'm amazed that the numbers are still here. Because it has holidays begun? School holidays, the first term here in Singapore. If you're tuning into this, school holidays begin, and all around the world we have the same phenomena. When school holidays begin, there's attrition rate, the members go. And it's understandable. And so, I'm amazed that you're all here. You give yourself a big pat on the back, right? It's very, very important that you're all here. What was I going to say? Pets. Oh, tens. <laughs> okay, I don't have it. In my, I only got my notes like this. Okay, so tens. Have you ever pitched a tent? Live you go for a holiday, you take your bags, say, seven days away in Taiwan, uh, ten days away in Hokkaido. You, you pack your bags accordingly, you go to a hotel, it's all nice. They didn't have that kind of thing. They pitched tents, then pull up the tents, then went. The first time I went camping in Port Dixon, about 30 miles from my hometown, right, we pitched the tent, it flew away. <laughs> we were just 15-year-old boys by the beach. We thought we were macho. You, you do that every day? And all of us came back sick from two days out there because we didn't know how to pitch a tent. They tented all the way and God tented with them. It's very important for us to realize. And so it's to give thanks to God for all things, give thanks to God for the harvest. And so seven days culminating on the last and great day. So that's a little bit of background for us to understand this. It happens here in Jerusalem, the capital. They all go there for this feast. It's a ritual that they repeat to remind themselves to be humble and trusting of God. And then what about this difference that Jesus has with his brothers? They got different reasons. They ask him to go from Galilee, a nowhere Galilee, a backwater called Galilee, to go to the, the big time. If you really want to show that you're a miracle worker, go, go in big time. And so we have American Idol. You got, you got talent. If you want to showcase your talent and go big time, you go there. Did you notice that Singapore has stopped Singapore Idol? Because we don't have enough talent for Singapore Idol. Every year. 
but they have. It's just a number. You, you're a miracle worker. So go to Jerusalem and show them. It was to showcase his signs, his miracle working. But Jesus is sent by God according to the prologue. The word became flesh, not simply to showcase that he was a miracle worker, but to reveal that he's son of God and son of man. Son of God was first introduced in 316. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Son of man will be lifted up. And he started to hint of that. Lifted up is the first reference to him dying on the cross. That was Jesus' agenda. So his brothers who grew up with him didn't understand that about him. Have you ever been misunderstood, misunderstood by your family? Misunderstood to what point? Here it doesn't capture it, but you go and read Mark chapter, chapter 3. They misunderstand him to the point that they think he's out of his mind. I asked the follow-up question, has any of your family thought that you're out of your mind? If you really are not suffering a medical, psychological problem, but they think you're so different, you're way out of, out of line. Different place. Jesus wanted to locate his ministry there in Galilee. The crowds were building up, but he wanted him to go big time in Jerusalem. Different timing. For them, it was another festival they would celebrate. For Jesus, he kept saying from John chapter 1 onwards, the time is not yet. My hour is not yet. But the actual Greek word here is not the hora word, H-O-R-A, that he uses, but the time word, kairos, from which we get time. Right? Chronometer, kairos. That's the Greek word. And so, what was he different? How was he different to his brothers? Theirs was still very much a science-based, right? a miracle-based faith that Jesus would not entrust himself to. You believe in me only for miracle working, and then you believe me for the wrong reason. I'm not come simplistically to work miracles in your midst. That's the simple part. I've come to do something greater that you need to understand that you could never do for yourself. Theirs was more a spectacular faith. His was just a saving faith. And why is that important? To get the identity of Jesus right is very, very important. So you keep hearing of scams in Singapore now? I don't know the last time I read an article, the number of people who got scam and con, right, mainly love scams, financial scams, was $600 million. I wouldn't be surprised that one day the figure very soon will climb to a billion dollars, which means there are a fair amount of significant number of Singaporeans who get the identity of who they fall in love with wrong. You must not get the identity of Jesus wrong. He hasn't come to con you. He hasn't come to scam you. And if his brothers got this wrong, they themselves will be part of a world that was darkened in their understanding. And more of that later. There are three disputes here. The first dispute is over Jesus' authority to teach. Chapter 7, verse 14 to 19. The second dispute about Jesus healing on the Sabbath, that he's a lawbreaker. The third dispute is about Jesus' origin and destiny. He tells us he's going somewhere and says we cannot come. But it all hovers around and it all builds up. You did keep disputing this about this rabbi from Galilee who turns up in Jerusalem, the headquarters and the premier place of, of theology. They plot to kill Jesus. They plot to kill Jesus four times. You cannot read John 4 and miss how much animosity, how much hatred, how much venom they had against Jesus. And it ends with them, the leaders, the chief priests and the Pharisees, sending the temple police. And why was the temple police different to the secular police? Because the Jews had right over their own religious matters to arrest him, to put their intention to kill him into place. Now, all that's important background. So let's go for the first dispute. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Basically, what's your qualification 
to come and teach here, and he was not just teaching by a lake, he was not teaching on a boat, he was not just teaching in the village, he was teaching in the most sacred of places, he was teaching in the temple area. What right do you have, small town rabbi, to come and teach in the temple area? Which school did you go to? Did you go to any of the schools that we are school in in Jerusalem, the top-notch people? And my teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. So, church member says, there's somebody who wants to meet you, have a meal with you. I said, give me the, the context. Not somebody in church, but a church member who knows this man. I said, yeah, years ago, I, you, I think you went to preach in that church and her life was in a shambles. The marriage is falling apart. She arrived at that church. She was crying. You preach a message and she accepted Christ. Uh, she was crying after the service. A, a, a leader walked up to her, asked her why, and then she's rooted and she's grown up in that church. And she's, she found out that I'm the pastor here. I said, okay, we go for that meal, fine. And she just thanked us profusely. I said, there's no need to thank. We're just spokesperson for God, right? That's all we are. And thank God that he saved you. And then she asked us, us unusual question, unexpected question. Did you go to RI or ACS? <laughs> I said, uh, why? Yeah, where do you learn your English? Why do you speak English so well? I, I said, I grew up in Malaysia. I went to a kampung school. I, I could see the disappointment on her face. Right, not RI, not ACS. <laughs> I don't think she was thinking, what right do you have to speak such proper English? But where did you get this? Can you think about it? You're a small town rabbi. What gives you the right to come here and with such sharp and sterling theology, which leads you, have you sought out your school lately? And that's an important thing, you know? And so it's so important that we send our people to the right places to train. Scott Sunquist was missionary, Presbyterian, American Presbyterian missionary here years ago when I first started the ministry. He's now gone back to be the president of Gordon Conwell uh, School where I did my demon, Pastor Adrian did his doctorate ministry, and also um, Marie, right, who is in charge of our children's church, did that. The first opening address that he gave is that Christianity is declining in America. We are seeing the slow but steady demise of Christianity, I paraphrase. And who is to be responsible for the slow and steady demise of American Christianity? It is us in our seminaries. The buck starts here, the buck stops here. We need to ask what kind of people are we training? And we need to ask what kind of people are we training? We do not send people off to Bible college and seminaries to be puffed up in knowledge. They, to come out more haughty, they should come out of Bible college more humble. Don't you think so? And that's so important. And who's the, all the fights? And then, you know, USA do, Today quotes, one of the main reasons Gen Z doesn't go to church in, in America, USA Today, is because they see all the bickering and fighting among Christians over Trump, over masks, over vaccinations. What witness are we giving to our children when the only thing we stand for is fighting with each other? And so be careful with school. If you are school, in Jesus' words, let me paraphrase it here for, for Singapore. We have a ministry of education. He's basically saying, he, the Lord Jesus, and his father run the ministry of education. The whole curriculum is written by them. If you, are down, if you are downloading this curriculum straight from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be okay. You download it from the wrong chief priests and priests and Sadducees and Pharisees. You download it and you will reject the total package of the divinity and humanity seen in the humility of Jesus. That's in a nutshell what it is. So sort out who you are learning this from. And all that we preach and teach here must be nothing less than what the Lord Jesus preaches and teaches. But more than preaching and teaching what we model in our lives, what spills over from our lips into our lives, into our marriages, into our families. And you must pray that for our pastors, pray that for our elders, pray for, for our deacons. So have you sought that out? Sorted that out? That's the first dispute. Where on earth did you get his learning from? Validate yourself. Second dispute, Jesus answered them, I did one work, and most likely he was referring in context to what was recorded in John 5, 
where he healed a paralyzed man, paralyzed for 38 years, and he healed him on a Sabbath. And he says, you marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it, was from, it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge by right judgment. What on earth does he mean by this? And so circumcision, circumcision began with circumcision, circumcision. A long time ago in their history, what was it? It was a symbol of perfecting the body and consecrating a child. You have to do that on the eighth day. If the eighth day, right, falls on the Sabbath day, you can still proceed with the circumcision. And so if you are not a lawbreaker for doing, cutting off a bit of flesh on a Sunday as a symbol of perfecting someone to the consecration of God, a boy to the consecration of God, have I broken, have I broken the Sabbath that I've healed a man completely from 38 years of paralysis. Where is the consistency of this? And as he does this, I'm told by the scholars, you know the method of teaching, we all have methods of teaching, the big word is pedagogy. Can you spell that? Right. So what's Jesus' pedagogy? He's a rabbi. And what he's using is a rabbinic teaching style, a rabbinic pedagogy, where he moves from, if the lesser is true, then the greater is without doubt, absolutely true. If you could circumcise on the Sabbath day, then why is it unlawful on the, on, uh, to heal on the Sabbath day? So the inconsistencies. So for the leaders, what road were they on? They were on a road to find a reason to not believe in Jesus, to truly nail him to the cross. And I want to ask you at this point, as you live, which road are you on? Are you looking for a reason to believe in Jesus, to deepen your belief in Jesus, to deepen your love and your worship for Him? Or are you looking for a reason to bail out on Him? It's very important, friends. So we find this, port, this pattern around the world, right? You can speak to pastors around the world, speak to pastors around Singapore. Sunday school. When our children most enthusiastic, at what ages? and they're most enthusiastic about singing. And every week we'll hear the report. They teach a new song, right? And there were lovely songs today, and the children are lapping it up, usually P1 to P4. And they can memorize the lyrics. So we had newcomers meal in my place, all newcomers invited to the man's, to meet leaders, to settle here, to answer your questions, etc. And the couple with their two kids who came, why did you come? Uh, our church, children's church, program, not so many children in the first place, so few of us, we're so tired, always giving but never receiving, okay, uh, what's, uh, how are the children now? Oh, the son comes back, he just loves the songs, can't stop singing, and it is uh, honestly, uh, Pastor Chris, many days we are too tired to go, but he wants to go. So what does that make the son? He's the evangelist, the parents are the, uh, sorry, I wouldn't say anything, yeah. And so he's enthusiastic, but we see a turn when they're P5 and especially P6. By the time we transfer them seamlessly here in ERPC to SEC1, and they go to our youth group called BASIC, under Pastor Roger and Pastor Jason, it's almost fashionable at SEC1, SEC2 to not sing at all. If you sing, yeah, what, what, okay, are you okay? What are you singing? It's no more fashionable to sing. Where did that come from? I want to say to you, that comes all the way from Satan. Who told you somewhere along the line that it's unfashionable to sing about the Lord Jesus? I pray from young to old you sing about Him. Amen? And that's why I'll pull, up, I'll pull the promo here. The church can fill up in one and a half hours. There are no more places. 1,100 places all gone. We'll ask for more rooms if we can. That's so wonderful. It really is wonderful. And we're cracking a joke on the, uh, the staff chat, right? People are trying to get in. They're asking questions, how to do this, how to do that. And we say, if only there was, if only that express how to get into the kingdom of God. 
I hope it expresses that. It's not, I want to go in because the, the Ramli burger there is so good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you sort out those reasons. I hope you sort out. The Gettys are coming. It could be the last time true because they're en route to Australia. But they kindly are stopping over. Last year, we were, by the grace of God, the first to host a, conf- uh, host a concert. And 3,000 people came and church leaders and Christians were also blessed. You remember the mood of April, May last year? You remember the mood of the last three years? We were all down in the doldrums. Anxiety was our number one emotion. And so God, they brought them here. And one of the heartbeats of the Gettys is that we sing in our hearts and sing in our homes with our children. For when we sing scripture, we grow up in Christ. And that's so important to download to our children. Can I encourage you when the tickets go on sale? We have the first shot at it. We always have the first shot of it because we are hosting church, right? So we give you the first shot, 24 hours, and after that is level playing field. It's public tickets out there. The first time that went, in the, within the first hour, 1,500, 1,700 seats all got snapped up. Now you know how uplifting that can be. There'll be two more seminars here. But that concert, invite your friends, because some of us are ministered to the most popular tune in the world that beats any secular music is, is, is Amazing Grace. And that song has saved more people than anybody else. It was written by a slave master, a slave seller. And so music does carry the gospel. And so are you looking for a reason to disbelief or believe in God. It's vitally important that we get this right. And so with music, I know as we go through our teenage years, we will have our different singers and we got to make sure, I wasn't a Christian until 18, 19, 19 years old, but I did struggle with the leftover, I love music. And I, though my Mandarin is zero or kaput, right? I listened to Teresa Tang. I don't know what she was singing about, except for the moon, right? Something about the moon, right? And it's a lovely song. Because I just, I, I've, I was in love with love. I was just looking for anybody who would love me back. That was me in my late teens and my early 20s. And so I grew up with those kind of songs. I grew up with my Elvis Presley and my Cliff Richard and the, and the Beatles and then the Bee Gees and then Ingelbert Humberting. Sounds like a bird, right? And we grew up with lyrics like, uh, lyrics like, uh, if he brings you happiness, this is Freddie Fender. If he brings you happiness, then I wish you all the best. <clears throat> but if he ever breaks your heart, I'll be there before the next teardrop falls. <laughs> For the life of me. You sing that enough of your former boyfriend and girlfriend. You're always waiting on TikTok or Facebook. Has somebody dropped her? Has somebody dropped him? Can I go back to the good old days we fell in love? You have to lessen that dosage and increase this. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I have. He is my everything. That sort of cancels it. So by all means, listen, but please compensate that kind of message. It's all about broken love. And more and more of the lyrics of this generation are now into four-letter words. They've normalized the swearing in songs. At least the lyrics I quoted you quite nice, right? If you ever break your heart, I'll be there before the next teardrop falls. My goodness, isn't that good? But today it's just F, F, F. And that's not the diet you want to feed your children. Are you looking for re- reasons to believe? Beware algorithm beliefs. Once you go down a track, it could be some big name, some theologian somewhere that says this is right, this is wrong. There's a big battle in England, the Church of England itself to be specific, because the bishops have just voted to bless LGBTQ unions. And I caught a clip of this. You should go and watch of Rico Ties, who used to work for All Souls Church in London, John Stott's church. And Rico Tai said a few years ago, if we ever vote to bless sin, the Holy Spirit leaves the Church of England. 
The Holy Spirit has left the Church of England a long time ago. You and me have no right to call sin a blessing, and we're still to bless it. If you're looking for a reason to stop believing, there'll be all sorts of bishops out there telling you to believe in a new theology. Revisionist gospel, revisionist sexuality, revisionist humanity, it's all revisionist, it's all progressive. If they are progressive, what does that make us? Regressive. It's all this, the devil's dark work in our lives. So what is it we are looking for? Can you answer the question? Are you on the road to finding evidence to deepen your belief and your love for Jesus? Are you on the road to finding the, any reason to drop him, to drop the Lord Jesus? It goes on, the third dispute. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come on my own. He who sent me is true. The sending, the sending, the sending is true versus the lies of the devil. And him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Jesus then said, I will no longer, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, but you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. What does he mean by this? He goes on. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And so they're thinking, Is he talking about him going to preach to diaspora Jews? Because the Jews have been exiled and they are all over the place. Not all of them are in Israel. Not all of them are able to come back to Jerusalem. So is he speaking about that? So they, they're confused about his coming, where he's come from. They're accused about his going. So when was the last time you played hide and seek? So yeah, Mona and me now have to play lots of hide and seek because our granddaughter. And she loves it. She's 22 months, and hide and seek has just happened two days ago. She was just playing hide and seek with Mona, and you know, hide behind the curtain, hide behind the chair. It's all so exciting. The suspense, the tension, right? Even though it's so obvious, yeah, yeah, Nai Nai is behind the chair. I can actually see them because they can't squat so well, right? <laughs> but for her, it's a great mystery. And when she comes out out of the curtain, oh, and we jump out from out of behind the sofa, she just laughs and laughs the great joy. Right, the, the spontaneity, the joy that is there in finding. If you reject Jesus, there'll be no spontaneous joy. There'll be no eternal joy because you've totally missed him. The word has become flesh. He was this perfect God-man. And all you're out to do as the Jewish leaders is to get rid of him because he stands in the way of your theology. You know the Bible passage that we began with? Come to me, all you who are thirsty. You read that, Isaiah 55. I just had a very long, quiet time with it when I was preaching a conference in, in Perth, standing by the beach. And he then goes on to say, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Come near to him while he is still there to be found. Israel never sought the Lord. And after that, they went into exile. This is the context. When Jesus offers, come, all you who are thirsty, and seek him while he may be found. He comes to finish his work, and then he rises, ascends, and returns to the Father, and brings glory back to the Father. And the glory to the Father is the saving of you and me. And so, why the world hates Jesus? The world cannot hate you, Jesus said to his brothers. It hates me. And why does the world not hate you? It hates me. Because I come to testify or witness that its works are evil. And in saying this, he was equating the Jewish leaders to the world. It's really an outworking and fulfillment of John chapter 1 in the prologue, where he says, says what? He came to the world, and though the world was made through him, 
the world did not receive him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. His own did not receive him. But all who believe in him and receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children not born of human descent or human will. They did not receive him. They did not believe in him. They are no different to the world. John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Israel is not different to the world. There is nothing more pejorative, nothing more condemning than that. So obeying law, obeying Moses and obeying Jesus, they were all about obeying the law. And they obeyed the law, they thought they, they were obeying Moses. And Jesus was saying to them, and I paraphrase for you, you are such law keepers, right? If you are such good law keepers, you should actually love me, not plot to kill me. For I ask you a trick question before we head to the end. And what's the trick question to ask you? Boil down the law to one sentence. In Jesus' teaching, he boiled down the entire Ten Commandments to two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and to love your neighbour as yourself. Is that right? The essence of the law, the substance of the law is love God and you express the love for God in loving neighbour. What the law prohibits is murder, premeditated murder. How dare you call yourself law keepers when you are plotting to kill me? Who is the lawbreaker? Yes, I heal on the Sabbath, but your hearts are plotting to kill me. Who is the law keeper? Answer is quite obvious, right? Who are the lawbreakers? And so we need to confess our hypocrisy. And what's our hypocrisy? The world is happy with Jesus. The world is happy with Jesus. The world is happy with Jesus as a miracle worker. You and I are happy with Jesus when you have a problem and he comes to solve the problem. You and I are happy with Jesus if you've got a need and he comes to meet your need. You and I are happy with Jesus if you've got an illness and he heals your illness. Nothing wrong. God does answer our prayers. He hears the cries of his people. But the Jews was, they up that one notch. I just want to keep seeing signs and miracles. So the world is happy to keep Jesus as a miracle worker or moral teacher. But the world hates Jesus as exposer of our sin. And whether it's the bishops of the Church of England, or whether it's you and me in our lives, that's what we hate. And so, far be it from just the people out there, how about us? If Jesus enters our life, he's going to show up sin in your heart. And he might show up the sin of the Samaritan woman who had five husbands already, or at least five men, and is living with one who is not her husband. Would you run off after encountering Jesus who offers her living waters and there the living waters is eternal life? By now, Jesus stands up and on the eighth day, the high priest stands at the high point of the temple. He gets a, a flagon of water that's taken from the pool of Siloam. He pours it there and offers the people living waters. And they think that comes from Ezekiel 47. And what's happening here? From chapter 1 to chapter 7, Jesus says, I've come to replace all those things. I'm the true temple. You destroy this temple, I will build it up in three days by my resurrection body. I'm the living waters. Here I am. I'm the bread of life. I feed your true hunger. That's what he's offering. No less than that. So, gospel lessons for us. We've got to sort out our hates and our loves. And we sit here and say, I'm a Christian. There are two groups of people. For those who claim ourselves Christians, I don't hate Jesus. But the more important question, the more searching and honest question to ask, I may not hate Jesus, but do I love people? Do I love his people? For the two things don't go together. I don't hate Jesus, but I hate my wife who is a Christian, my husband who is a Christian. I can't tolerate my father who is a Christian. I can't tolerate my son. It can't work that way. So we may not overtly hate Jesus, but we covertly love ourselves at the expense of loving people. If we sincerely love Jesus, we will sincerely love others by going the extra mile to break the barriers. Let me go back one step. 
Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Have you ever been asked to minister to people late at night? Yes, sometimes we do. Or a lot of times we do. So sorry, Pastor, please call you. I, I know it's almost midnight. We don't want to call you, but there's a crisis. My family, can, can, we, can we come down and see you? Let's just talk to you on the phone. It's all right. I said, please, that's what we're here for. Please. Right? Jesus is tired from a whole day of ministry. Nicodemus comes up and says, what do you mean by this? Born again. Have we spoken patiently, patiently to someone through the night, gospeling them, telling them to keep on believing? And then you find him walking the extra mile up this escarpment to Samaritan territory, unclean territory, to speak to a solitary woman there at the well. And then he singles out this paralyzed man who can't get into the water. Every single one of those episodes, the one-to-one -one encounter, is an expression of Jesus' love, Jesus' compassion. He didn't have to do this. The late-night conversations, the extra walk through Samaritan territory, he didn't have to do this. He didn't have to do this. But he's the word become flesh. And so we need to allow ourselves, which road are you on? Are you traveling on? And I've said this in our C.S. Lewis. He writes this book about the older devil interning and apprenticing the younger devil, right? And each one of them has a human to work on. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest thinkers and authors in the English-speaking language, got converted very late. After he converted, he was full on for Jesus, absolutely full on for Jesus. And he says to the, the younger demon, huh, how come the, the human being you look after got converted, became a Christian? But he says, don't worry. All the habits of your patient, right, both mental and bodily, are still in our favor. What does he mean by that? That you may be converted at a point in time, but there's a series of habits, deep series, oh, deep habits of thinking, speaking, feeling, behaving. So spiritual warfare and spiritual habits at church. I love Jesus, but we keep di being disappointed with the church generally. We keep being disenchanted with fellow Christians. We can't go on living like that. I love Jesus, but I don't love his people. I'm irritated by the person in my DG, and I pray they will go to another DG. Sorry. Yeah. It's very simple to solve problems in, in our churches today, and ELPC is like a classic one. And what's the classic one in ELPC? We've got five services in two places. By next year, we'll probably have seven services in three places. If you don't like someone here, you have six other services to go to. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a good church. Then we've got 88 discipleship groups. Of course, sometimes you'll find yourselves irritating, frustrating, but those are very light-hearted words. If you hit a roadblock with somebody, the way to deal with it is not to run away to another church. It's to deal with it face to face and allow the power of, of, of the cross and the power of the Spirit to work in you. Love and forgiveness and reconciliation and maturation to be like Christ from that point onwards. And so we keep doing this. Spiritual warfare at the home, we build up such habits of mutual annoyance and daily pinpricks. Is that true? As you live at home? This is not my language, you know. This is C.S. Lewis in the sharpness of his thinking and the sharpness of his speaking, of his writing. So I want to ask you, you find your spouse irritating? Don't answer. Increasingly irritating. That you, are, you think that your spouse exists to guess like you all the time. Your children are given by God to guess like you to unholiness. Because if you didn't have children, you'd be so holy. You walk around your house holy, but your children come to your life, my goodness, they blew my holiness apart. God didn't give you a spouse, didn't give you children, didn't give you parents to be unholy. He gave you the exact parents, the exact spouse and exact children for your holiness. Holiness is always relational in the gospel. So never get used to thinking that your wife is annoying, your husband's annoying. And when two human beings have lived together for many years, each has tones of voice and expressions faced that are almost, cannot even pronounce that, unendurably Irritating. You don't understand that word is that in, in the language here you're watching. Betahan. Cannot stand this person. I can't stand. Irreconcilable differences is the legal word out there. And more marriages hit the rocks and they give the light-hearted thing or the legal escape clause of 
irreconcilable differences. We as Christians have no right to get on that road. Whatever differences, you know, you fell in love when you were dating because I fell in love with Mona because she's so different. I can't complain after 36 years, why are you so different? You fell in love with her because she was so different. Are you going to fall out of love now because she's so different? It's the same God who gave her to me when we were dating. Same God who watches over my marriage 36 years later. I must never turn to God and say, you know, she's become so different. God's answer is, yes, she's different. That's why you married her. Because you want to love yourself, you can do this. <laughs> if you want to love yourself, just love yourself. You're supposed to love a person who is different to you, given by grace to your life to help you grow in godliness. I just made all of you laugh, right? That's what we do in our marriage enrichment retreats. Please come along. So Salem keeps working on double standards. From every quarrel you have at home, you walk away very convinced both are righteous, both are right, and both are innocent. Isn't that true? You're having a quarrel with your father, both walk away to their rooms, I'm right, I'm right. Both can't be right about a wrong. One person is right. God is. And so we may travel very far for things. So why do we get into such deep-rooted habits? Because we always use self-rescue. Why are we using to justify not loving others? Please answer that yourself before we close and sing our closing song. I don't hate Jesus, that's not the issue, but do you love people? People that I sent into your life. You can't proclaim to love Jesus if we don't love the people. And we need love. We need Jesus' love to redeem us. He stands there, this is living waters you can't get by yourself. This hunger you cannot feed. It's only Him who can do this for you. And so how far will we go to love? Jesus came from the glories of heaven to the goriness of earth. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. It's called incarnation. He entered our world to quench our thirst, to feed our hunger. How far will you go to love? So this is Josiah Sisson. Josiah Sisson and his friends Christmas a few years ago, 2016, 2017, in, in Australia, Brisbane, I think, went to watch the lights around their neighborhood, the Christmas lights, as they were walking. Then as they were walking, they heard a loud screech, then bang, a car hit them, and Josiah Sisson was killed immediately on the spot by that car. Here's Josiah Sisson, nine years old, handsome boy. Right. Here's the car who killed him, which killed him. So if you were the parents, how would you respond to this driver? Father is a pastor. Josiah Sisson's father is pastor, Carl Sisson. This is what happened. Adrian Murray, the driver of the car, turned up at the church service to say sorry, and the father embraced him. How far will we go to love and with love? You do not come to ARPC or any church for information. You come to ARPC for reformation, for revival. Reformation comes when you hear the Word of God. Revival comes when the Word of God plays out in your life by the Spirit of God. Hunger and thirst for Jesus. Hunger and thirst. When you walk out from here, when we sing the final song, right? I have nothing but Jesus. Jesus is all I have. You cannot plead your rank, your role. You cannot plead the law. You cannot plead your ministry. You cannot plead anything. You can only plead Jesus. And is there someone in your family itself that you have to walk the six meters across your HDB lobby to say, sorry, son, I thought this of you. I said this of you. Sorry, mum, I was rude and disobedient to you just then. Sorry. You may travel the world to do ministry, but you won't walk across your dining room or between your rooms to say sorry. We must. We are the people of God. When we do that, because of Jesus, overwhelmed by Jesus' love, empowered by the Spirit of God, 
that revival will come and flow into our lives, liberate us and set us free from Satan and sin, and live this life to the glory of God. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. The musicians come forth. The word of God never returns to God void. So God in His grace has spoken His word. And God in His grace has given us Jesus. The word become flesh. Jesus has entered our life to offer us. Come to me, all you who are thirsty. Come to me, all you who hunger. Heavenly Father, we pray never, no more, will we go to the wrong places and the wrong persons to satisfy our thirst, to fill our hunger. For we are so fickle with what would satisfy us. But more than our thirst and hunger, which are fleeting and subjective, we read John's Gospel, your revelation to us about your Son. We read John's Gospel, and by your Spirit, may you open our minds, soften our hearts to hear about you, Lord Jesus. That it's your thirst that matters. That it's your hunger that matters. That you thirsted after our salvation to the point of giving up your life for us. May we love you. May we follow you. Get us off the road of hatred. May we not simply think that we don't hate you, but we justify our lack of love for one another. For that will be an inconsistency. Or shine the light into our lives that we will see the inconsistency and be brought to new life, to live increasingly in truth, in love and in oneness, set us on this road of Calvary. That you were so hated, but you so loved us in return. And we pray to have your spirit fill us, liberate us, to be a shining witness unto your glory. Amen. Amen.